Hey guys, welcome to our last clinic. So we're all excited. Uh, glad you guys can make it. Uh, let me know what I'm dealing with before we get started. How many are here as umpires? Appreciate it. Umpires, and then how many coaches? Very good. How you doing? Good. Right. Hey guys, our theme for tonight, we're going to go as quickly as we can to get you back on the road. I know some of you have traveled uh, at least two hours away, but the theme for the night is change. We have a lot of changes we're going to talk to you about. We're going to break it down for you. We're going to explain it. But also, this clinic, much different than others in the past, it's an open forum. If you have questions, I want you to ask. Before you leave, I want everybody on the same page before we take off outside the doors, okay? I'm Greg Reed, one of the assistant executive directors, and uh, naturally oversee baseball, also basketball, soccer, tennis, cross country, uh, lots of sports. But uh, baseball, one of my favorites. I have a background in baseball, played college baseball. I uh, have always enjoyed the sport. So to be part of this movement and change, uh, it's a great honor, and we're excited uh, to, to make this happen. And uh, we hope you're as excited. The first change that we have is basically how we get corporate partners, how we make our office run. Uh, it used to be that our office staff would go out, hit businesses up, try to solicit funds so we can make things run. Because we run off championships and we run off corporate partners only. We get zero tax dollars. So my background was in education, working with kids. We thought Metro News would be better suited to do our marketing. So we've signed an eight-year deal with Metro News to do all of our marketing. And we've just signed uh, MedExpress for three more years. If you have a MedExpress close to you, um, congratulations. It's a good company. We use MedExpress here personally. Uh, if you can't get in to see your doctor, MedExpress can get you in quickly, get you out within an hour. Uh, my doctor even recommends that I go to MedExpress sometimes when he can't see me. But coaches, for you, uh, if you have an athlete on that first day, doesn't have a physical, instead of waiting a week or two weeks to get in to see the doctor to get the physical, you can send them to a MedExpress, 30 bucks in and out. And we have like 23 different locations throughout West Virginia. Uh, where you guys are, I'm not sure. I know Mr. Gandy, Clarksburg, you, you guys have a couple. Okay, Joey though, I'm not sure, Richwood. Uh, how you get to a Meg Express, but the options there uh, if you're close close to one. Um, if you do have cell phones, please just silence those. If you do need to take a phone call, please step out. Uh, we don't want to hear you talking, but we understand some of you are very, very important, okay, in your own minds. So please step out, take your phone call, and then come back in and join us. What makes us different at the SSAC? The three S's. Safety, when you talk about baseball, safety is a vital part of this. Coaches and umpires, you play an important role keeping our children, our student athletes safe. Uh, all the way from warm up, the time you walk in and do warm up tosses, all the way through seven innings of action. Uh, we're gonna talk about a new dugout rule uh, where we keep everybody in dugouts, try to keep everybody safe, just trying to add to the safety. Sportsmanship, um, I wish that I had a magic button for you guys with sportsmanship and especially dealing with outside the fence, uh, areas that you guys do not control. Uh, I will tell you this, if you have parents or fans that are unruly, a little bit out of control, you don't need to take that into your own hands. Make sure you go to administrators and have them help you uh, take care of those fans, okay? If you're an umpire, please, please don't get in debates with uh, parents and fans about the call that you just made, okay? That, that's, that's not really any of their business. You don't have to justify yourself to any parent or fan, okay? And I see it every time I go out to games, even in basketball, I'll see an official turn around and say, well, picked up his pivot foot because they're yelling walk. That, the officials don't need to do that, okay? Just call the game. The best thing you can do is shut them out because I promise you it's probably not very good what they're yelling. 
And if you can shut them out, that's great. If they get out of control, though, just have them removed. Okay? But sportsmanship's getting worse uh, in all sports. And I, if you have recommendations to make it better, I'm, I'm all for it. Okay? We will take all those recommendations and try to implement them. Uh, the last one is scholarship. Uh, West Virginia, we still have requirements academically. Uh, still have to have a 2.0. Uh, even though it's a C average, a lot of people think that's, you know, maybe a low uh, GPA to have to still be eligible, but we're one of the few states that still has a GPA. Uh, I know coming from the Eastern Panhandle to skip right over next door to Maryland, all they had to do was pass all their courses, their core courses, and they were eligible. They could make straight D's, have a 1.0, be eligible. Okay. Florida, even more lenient, uh, actually, if you're enrolled in a school in Florida, chances are uh, you're eligible. Okay. And if you ever get Florida athletes coming to West Virginia and they come into your schools, the 2.0 rule will be very confusing to them because they're not used to that type of language. Okay. So we're still hanging on to some academic uh, standards in West Virginia. Our website has even changed. Okay. It used to be, if you dealt with the old website last year, everything was on the right side. You had to scroll down, click 20 times before you could find something. This year, we have added everything at the top. It's much easier. You see it on the first screen. Your admin login is still in the same locations. It's in the upper left corner. Now, umpires, for you to get in to the admin login, you need to use your registration number in all caps username and password. Coaches, you're just the opposite. You're going to type in WV Coach in lowercase for the username and password. And that'll get you in to your login information. Okay? And uh, we coaches, you have to use that to rate the officials. Okay? Which we'll talk about in a little bit. Here's the old screen what I'm talking about, what it used to look like. Uh, everything on the right. Uh, so we like it much better up top where you can see it. But there's your username password, and this still looks the same. Officials, umpires, these dates are very important for you. These are your test dates. Part one starts February 27th. It's a two week window uh, to complete that. Why is part one important? It's a pretest, it gets you ready for part two. Also, if you don't take part one, it eliminates you from postseason. Uh, work. Okay, you are suspended from postseason if you don't take part one. You don't have to score a certain score, you just have to take the test. Okay, part two uh, is very, very important. It starts March 20th, runs through April 3rd. Please write these down, do not miss the deadline. Okay, uh, we do have uh, alternatives now if you do miss the deadline. But let me explain to you first. Part two, you have to score well. It's part of your rating system. It's an open book test. But if you score 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it's really going to hurt your rating, drop you down maybe from a class one to a class two, maybe even a class three. So it's that important. What if you miss the deadline? On part two, uh, Roberta here in the office who handles uh, umpires and officials throughout the year, Roberta has uh, the power to extend this two more weeks, but she will open up a window for you individually to take the test if you miss the part two deadline. It costs you $50, but it won't drop you a class. It used to be if you missed part two deadline, we'd suspend you for one year and you couldn't work. Well, as you know, in baseball, umpires, we have a shortage. Uh, basketball, we have 900 officials. Baseball, 200, okay, and we're still covering the same amount of schools. It's getting to a point where it's starting to scare us a lot, uh, not being able to cover games. And when we talk about the new postseason format, you'll see what I'm talking about, umpires, okay? So uh, you, if you want work as an umpire, you're going to have an opportunity to work, okay? So uh, but make sure you meet all these deadlines. If you don't take part two, uh, for, for the first two-week window or the extended week windows, the two-week window. Uh, we don't even suspend you for the following year. We just drop it to a class three, and you can't work varsity games. OK? 
Okay, so just a little heads up there. Your packets, we gave these out at the interpreters meeting um, almost two weeks ago, right, Charlie? And uh, if you don't have your packets on PIRES, uh, your association, somebody in your association has those. If you've had a meeting since then, which we hope you have, you should have been given your packets. We also have your packets online. Okay, so you can go to our website, wbssac.org, and find your packet. Special reports. If you write a special report for an ejection, coach or player, umpires, I need that report within 24 hours. Don't wait three, four days to get me the report. Because when we deal with ejections, we deal with suspensions, we call everybody that's been ejected, we call the principal, AD, to let them know that they'll be sitting out a certain amount of games. We can't do that if we don't have the report, okay? So make sure you get those in a timely fashion. Cell phones, uh, this is simply added because uh, a few years ago we had an umpire that liked to use his cell phone during the contest. Um, actually, he was a true story. He was ordering pizza in between innings, so it was ready for him at the end of the game, okay? He was reported. So now we have this whole thing that we talk about. Please don't use your cell phones, even if you're extremely hungry. Um, you know, just if you're hungry that night, just take a night off and, and go eat, okay? So uh, it's part of being a professional and working as an umpire. <coughs> class ones and twos only for sectional tournaments. Uh, could there be possible class threes this year? Yes, uh, but it has to be permission through this office before we uh, grant that. We have to exhaust all ones and twos before we get to that. Uh, but like I said, postseason's changing and there's mandatory start dates, which means mandatory games that have to be played. And we're a little concerned about our numbers of class ones and twos in certain sections of the state. Class ones is what we're shooting for in the regional tournament. You've earned that right if you're a class one to work uh, in the regional and we will only take class ones in the state tournament. Here's our patch. It's the only patch that we have, okay? Uh, we ask that you wear this when you are calling, representing one of our member schools. We ask that you do not wear the patch if you're calling games that do not represent or are not sanctioned by one of our schools. Example, travel leagues in the summer um, shouldn't be wearing a patch because parents have this misconception that you work for me. They think that you are hired by me. They don't understand that you're independent contractors. And whoever assigns you to that game, that's who you're working for, okay? They think you're straight SSAC people. So moms are unhappy because they're nine and under. A uh, little boy got beat and it was the official's fault, so they'll call me and say, you're an umpire that cost me the game last night, okay? And this is in the summertime. And two things, I don't care about nine and under so much, okay? and you wear your patch identifies you with us, okay? So uh, just wear your patch during our games and things will go quite nice to you. Self-nomination, this is very important by April 10th. If you feel like you're ready to work a state tournament and you want us to take a look at you, uh, we'll come out and watch you, okay? But for you to work a state tournament, you have to throw your name out there and self-nominate, okay? If you're class one, you think you're ready, or if you've worked state tournaments before, you want to work another one, by all means, please self-nominate and apply for the job. Game reports are due by August 1st. That's every single year, August 1st. No exceptions. Part of your rating system, okay? Online registration. Billy, he talked to you a little bit about Arbiter. Uh, the only thing I can tell you about Arbiter is if you do make the state tournament, you will be paid this year through Arbiter. Uh, we will not write checks uh, and bring those or mail those to you. We will simply direct deposit your money into your Arbiter account. You have to sign up for Arbiter anyway to take part one, part two. Uh, please go ahead and take the next stage and sign up for Arbiter Pay also. Do we have anybody in here using Arbiter Pay already? Good. What part of the state? Here. Here in Parkersburg. I know Eastern Panhandle, we've been doing it for seven, eight years. Um, Clarksburg area, still not for the payment yet, or assignments, assignments, yes, assignments, yes. okay, 
So uh, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're wanting to be an arbiter state, but we understand it's a process too, trying to get the entire state to, to move towards this movement of arbiter. Now, here we get into some major changes, which is good. Okay, Last year, and for however long we've had baseball, almost 100 years, we've had an innings rule with our pitchers. This is the first year the National Federation said, we are mandating that you go to a pitch camp. But you as a state and association will determine the numbers. So our coaches advisory committee for baseball has come up with the following numbers. Now, do I have any middle school coaches in here? Okay, here, here's what I wanna do, because I, I don't have time to cover like all the numbers, but all the rules apply to middle school as high school, except your numbers are different, okay? So when I explain numbers, I'm just explaining how it works. You guys take your numbers, which is on the bottom line, and make it work with our rules, okay? Now, with high school, if you have a pitcher that throws one to 30 pitches in a day, they can come back the next day, zero days rest, and throw. So if you have a nice closer, or you have a middle reliever, and you're limiting their pitches, Okay? If you keep them under 30, they can come back with no day's rest. They can do that three days in a row. The fourth day, they have to take a day off. So three consecutive days, you can throw one to three. Fourth day, you take off. Okay? So everybody understand that. Now, when we get to 31 pitches, 31 to 50, now we're taking a day's rest. Okay? 51 to 75, two days rest. And then 76 to 110, three days rest. Okay? Now, I will tell you this. If you've been involved in Little League, they have a, like a continuation, finish the batter type rule for these progressions. We do not accept when we get to 110. So if you throw 31 pitches, it doesn't matter. If you're in the middle of a, a bat, that takes you to a day's rest. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Um, what constitutes a pitch? Let's keep it simple. If the umpire calls a ball or a strike or there's unlimited fouled off pitches, those count as pitches. Okay? Intentional walks do not. Balks do not. Warm up throws in between innings do not. If a pitcher gets dinged by a batted ball and the umpire wants that pitcher to throw three or four pitches to see if they can stay in the game, those do not. All right? So that's what constitutes a pitch. Now, when a pitcher does get to 110, our top number, that pitcher is allowed to finish the at-bat. Okay? So that pitcher can go to 111 to 120, depends on how many foul off pitches we have uh, during that at-bat. But then they must be removed as soon as that at-bat's up. Yes? So as an example, Somebody throws 110 pitches on Monday. Right. They're not eligible to come back until Friday. That's correct. Okay. So it's not Monday's one day, Tuesday, Wednesday, then back Thursday. It's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for us. Right. That's that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It's not on the umpires to regulate that, right? No. And I'm going to get to that here in a second. Okay. Um, there it talks about no player can pitch four consecutive days that we talked about, okay? Now, even if a game is called, okay, and this is very important come tournament time, uh, even if a game is called because of darkness or weather, if that pitcher has thrown 31 or more pitches, they cannot come back the next day to finish the game, okay? Those pitches stay, they count, and we still use our progressions as far as days rest, okay. So I want you to. So if you're, if there's a chance of rain uh, or darkness, you may want to just think about keeping that pitcher under 30 so they can come back the next day. Yes. Double headers. Double headers. It's, it's pitches per day, okay. Pitches per day. All right. Now, as we talked about, game officials, umpires, you're not responsible whatsoever. Okay. This is strictly on the head coaches. Okay, and we're going to talk about how to chart these pitches, because that's the complex part. 
and that's the part that's critical for our head coaches to make them accountable for pitchers' arms. Um, if you do violate the pitch count rule, it's like playing an ineligible player. It's going to be a forfeiture of that game. Okay, and coaches, uh, the first time will probably count it as just an error on your part. The second time, you will face a 10% suspension for messing this rule up twice. Okay, so make sure that you're on top of your game and you understand. Now, umpires, I will tell you this part. With everybody keeping count of pitches, make sure that you don't fall asleep and lose count on pitches, okay? Because some of you will kind of daze out or phase out on us and uh, lose, lose the count and have to ask for help. If you ask for help this year, there'll be lots of people helping you. Okay, they'll know the count this year. Okay, so stay on top of your game and use your clicker and make sure that you get every pitch. Okay, because it's going to be more valuable than ever. All right. Um, Greg, would you go through the uh, progression about a pitcher pitching two pitches and they want to play more? Okay. Uh, remember, we said intentional walks do not count as pitches, but coaches, you need to. If you're going to walk somebody, put them on immediately because if they throw a couple pitches and then you come out of your dugout and say, go ahead and put them on, those pitches are not eliminated because they've thrown a couple pitches. Okay, so that'll be part of the pitch count also. Okay? Thank you, Charlie, for that reminder. Now, charting the pitches. This part I want you to listen to closely. We have devised a form and we've put it on our website. It's called Pitch Count Chart. All head coaches need to download this chart and you will keep this chart in a three ring binder. It's gonna be an open document for opposing teams coming in. And it's also an open doc document for you as a coach to go to the visitor and ask about their pitch count, who pitched the day before, how many pitches did he throw, that type of information. That is gonna be open. You can't refuse to give that to the opposing coach, okay? Plus it's gonna be charted the day before by the team they played anyway, so you can always grab it from them, but to, you know, and if you wanna know a day in advance, you can do that. You can call and scout and say, hey, who they throw, how many pitches, and they have to give that information to you, okay? Now, here's how it's gonna work. The home dugout, you will have one of your assistants or somebody in the dugout to keep track. The visiting dugout will also have somebody in the dugout keeping track. So we have both dugouts keeping track of pitch counts. A lot of you coaches did this anyway, so it's nothing new. It's just mandatory now that we use the numbers. Now, host schools is all, will also hire, not hire, but you will assign somebody to be the pitch count recorder in a designated area preferably a press box. But I understand for smaller schools, maybe you don't have a press box. Just put them in a neutral area. So we have three people keeping track of the pitch cam. Every half inning, these three people will quickly come together and come up with the number. We're hoping all three people have the same number. Realistically, is that gonna happen every time? No. If it does, that's the number we go with and we go back to our dugouts, we play. We don't want to hold up the game. So this is why we have this system. So three out of three, go, let's get ready to throw. Because we've got, what, five warm-up pitches, and then we're playing. And our game is long enough anyway. Okay, so we don't want to hold it up anymore. If two out of three have the same number, that's the number we're going to go with. The third person will need to adjust their numbers accordingly. Okay, what happens if all three numbers are different? We go to the pitch count recorder. Yeah, it used to be the home dugout or home book. No, it's going to be the pitch count recorder that's in a designated area. We're going to go with that count. Both dugouts adjust and then we move on. So there shouldn't be any arguments or discrepancies or time wasting methods to this. Three of three, go. Two of three, go. One of three, pitch count recorder. Okay? At the end of the game, on this chart that we have devised, the head coach of both teams will sign off, 
and the pitch count recorder will sign off as well. Three signatures, complete game. It's in your binder for the rest of the year. If I want to come to your game and say, Coach Underwood, can I please, uh, I'd like to see your pitch count uh, folder. Then he hands it to me, I look at all 30 games, okay? If there's a discrepancy and we have to get involved, we'll call and ask for those documents, okay? <coughs> Hopefully there won't be. Uh, we don't want to be involved with that. We want our schools working together collaboratively to uh, make baseball better, okay? You guys have any questions on that? That's a big change for us. Now what if the coach comes up to an umpire during the game and says, hey, they're, they're using a the picture that's being used illegally. What's the umpire in that situation? There's nothing the umpire can do. Okay. okay. Just self-report to our office, and okay. then we'll take care of it. Take it up with you guys. Yeah. Okay. I don't want the umpires worried about this stuff. Okay. It's not their responsibility. They have enough just to call the game, keep the game moving. Okay. It's up to our coaches to be professional and handle this, all right? And the rule is to put in to protect student athletes and their arms, okay? And that's what we want to do. If you don't like the numbers after this year, uh, there's a coach on the committee in your area, or you can call our office and you can speak with me personally, and we can look at adjusting numbers, okay? This is a first year trial. We understand there could be some tweaks that we need to make. And we did that years ago with basketball. Might have to do it with baseball, okay? And we understand that. So uh, please don't hesitate to, to let us know. Now, Charlie? Uh, cross the river. Yes. Hey, coaches, no matter where you play your game, you've got the same pitch count rules, okay? The only difference is now you don't have to collaborate with the other uh, bench. Uh, during this game, because uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, they're, they're all going to have pitch counts, but it might be just a little bit different number-wise than ours. But if you go to Myrtle Beach, if you go to Mingo Bay for that big tournament, you still have to follow our pitch count rules, okay? You're not now uh, adapting to South Carolina's pitch count <coughs> rules. All right, does that make sense? Thank you, Charlie. Any other questions? Okay. Now, here's a major, major change, coaches and umpires. Postseason play has changed. We used to be in four sections. Now we're down to two bigger sections, except Triple A still at three and four teams in the section. Double and single A, you go from anywhere from five teams to eight teams in your section. So we've changed the format of postseason. And I'll, I'll try to walk through it. First of all, let's go to the sectional tournament. The sectional tournament is going to be a double elimination tournament. It's going to be seeded by the coaches. The coaches are going to be given a ballot from our office that has all the teams in your region on that ballot. So if you have five teams in your section and there's six in the other section, I'm going to send you a ballot with 11 schools on it. You as a head coach are going to vote for all those schools except for your own. You're going to ship that ballot back to us, we're going to count the ballots, and then we're going to ship the seedings back to you for your sections. And you're going to put it in a double elimination tournament. To make it easy for you, we've even put all the brackets online. Okay, so if you have a three team section, a four team section, five all the way to eight, we have all the brackets online wvssac.org, go to the sport of baseball, and you will see all the brackets, okay, how it works, okay? So coaches, just like basketball, basketball coaches see the section and the region, you guys are now going to do the same, all right? Now, here's the kicker. All sectional tournaments, no matter what classification, you will start on Monday, May 8th with your tournament. No exceptions. Triple A, because they had few, fewer teams, would wait till Wednesday or Thursday or Friday of that week to start the tournament because we have a whole other week. Everybody starts on Monday, May 8th, even Triple A. Okay, double elimination. We have the seeds from the coaches. We play. All right? Now, 
when you get to the regional, here's the part I like. Um, the regional, you know how baseball is always set up on series, especially with major league, they get together, play three game series, four game series. Now, we're gonna have a series in the regional tournament. Uh, whoever comes out of the two sections, you're gonna play a two of three series, okay, to determine, uh, to see who goes to the state tournament. It used to be we would have a semi-regional game. If you lost it, you were out. You moved to the regional final. If you lost it, you were out. It's one and done, okay, because we had four sections. Now we're down to two sections, so we're gonna play a best two of three to see who goes to the state tournament. That seeding is also gonna be based on your first ballot. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll have a, whoever comes out, whoever had the highest seed will be the home team for games one and three, if necessary. Okay, and I forgot to tell you this, and uh, this part is subject uh, to change, but right now in your sectional tournament, the highest seeded team will always host in the section. So if you're a one seed, you're never going to leave. If you're a sixth seed, you're never going to host. Okay? It's kind of the advantage of being a higher seed. If you're a two seed, you're going to host most of the time, except for when you're lucky enough to play the one seed. All right? So the higher the seed, the better opportunity you have to host. In the regionals, the higher seed will host game one. We'll go to the lower seed for game two. And then if we have a determining game, we'll go back to the higher seed for game three. All right? Any questions on that? Now, when you get to the regional, if you're fortunate enough to get to the regional, we now have eight teams remaining in each class. Okay? Two in each region. I'm going to send you another ballot. You are now going to fill out the ballot to seed the state tournament. The first time in West Virginia's history, we're going to seed the state tournament. It used to be region one would line up with region three. You might have the two best teams in the first game of the state tournament. Okay, so now we're going to see them. One will play four, two will play three, two winners will play in the championship. Okay, we really like that part too. Okay, any questions on postseason? All right, I, I, we sent you uh, all this information to your ADs and your principals probably a month and a half ago so you could look at it and uh, try to understand it. But we also have it in the Interscholastic on our website, word for word, how it plays out. So if you have any questions, go to the Interscholastic and it will help you. Uh, a couple other changes here. Out of season coaching. Trying more and more to get uh, our coaches linked with our athletes with sports specific activity. So, uh, you know how you had three weeks in the summer to work with your kids, you still have three weeks in the summer, but we've just changed the flexibility of that. It used to be weeks 50, 51, 52, no matter what. Now, starting week 49 through week four, as long as we have three consecutive weeks, uh, you can run your three week period according to what your Board of Education sets up. I will tell you this, uh, if you have more than one school in your county, all the schools have to have the same three weeks in that county and it's for all the sports, okay? Baseball is very difficult for us because we're just coming out of our season. A lot of the kids go straight into summer league ball. You're probably not involved with a whole lot of three week stuff. Uh, but if you are, check out your county states, see what they are and then work with them, okay? Here's one of the major changes that could affect you right now. We have added six flex days to uh, the schedule, okay? This is six more opportunities for you to work with your student athletes with a ball, with a glove, with a bat, okay? You can do practices, you can do skills and drills, you can be involved, okay? Baseball season starts February 27th. You need to use those six days before the 27th or you lose them. Has anybody used any days yet? No? What you do, you want to get with your principal and I know the weather's bad. If you're lucky to have indoor hitting facilities or if you have turf fields where you can get out and hit them some balls, uh, you know, I'm not sure what you can do or what your facilities uh, allow you to do. But before the 27th, 
you have six opportunities there where you can work with your kids. Okay? Get your pitchers and catchers out. If nothing else, get them throwing in a gym somewhere. Uh, try to get the arms in shape a little bit early. Okay? Uh, you can use these days right before your season starts. You just can't use them as a trial period. They can't count as any of your 14 practice days or anything like that. They're totally separate. They're totally out of season. All right? Um, your principal and you will assign these and uh, keep record of them. Um, and you cannot use Sundays as a day of activity. That is, those are off limits um, unless you have permission from our office. And it has to be something unique before Mr. Dolan will approve those. Uh, we did approve one in Petersburg. Uh, I will give you that one. They have a White Sox coach from the Chicago White Sox coming in, wants to do a clinic. Coaches want to learn as well as his athletes. The only time that coach can come in is on a Sunday, and Mr. Dolan has granted permission for that. Okay, or the board of—I should say the board of directors. It has to go through our board for you to have Sunday permission. Okay, but if you call us up and say, "Hey, just want to get out, get the kids throwing and stuff on Sunday," that'll be a no. Okay. Any questions on flex days? That's something that's. Uh, you guys have like an extra month now with athletes outside the season. So you have, what, three months in season, and then another month. That's about all they want to see anyway, to be honest with you, and probably all you want to see then. So, but it gives you an opportunity to, to help make them better. On this slide, on the right, this is very important for you guys now because of the seating process. Update scores online to help with the seating process. In football and basketball, it's mandatory for your schools to update the scores. If you don't have football scores by noon on Monday, $50 fine. Okay? We're not going to fine you in baseball, but if it's a big issue of schools not putting scores online, then we may have to revisit this. But uh, I know coaches, you probably do not put scores online, but your ADs do. Make sure your ADs are updating these every single week, okay? Because you should be able to go, especially if you're not going head-to-head -head with somebody, but you have to see them for the region, you need to see scores. You need to see who they're playing, okay? You need to keep track of how to see properly and fairly, okay? So update your scores online. Coaches, you get 14 practice days. Starting February 27th, 14 days before your first contest. Okay? The only time this is reduced to seven is if your basketball team advances to the point where they can't get 14 practices in and they're baseball kids, they come out, they need seven practices for the first contest. Okay? But they have to come back on the first date, school date available to practice. Okay? If they miss that first date, they have to go to 14, they'll never get it in baseball because you guys are playing every single day. Okay, so make sure they're there that first day after basketball season concludes. This year we have the Wilson A-1010. This is the last year of Wilson. Next year we're going to the Spalding TF Pro in 2018. All right, the Spalding TF Pro is a lot like the Wilson. Actually, all National Federation approved balls are about the same. Um, the baseball community seems to be uh, a diamond type group. Uh, diamond only makes one ball. We do all ball contracts, so there's no basketball, there's no football with Diamond. So Spalding has it all. Wilson has it all, but Spalding beat him out in the contract bid. So that's what we'll use the next five years. I'll be honest, when we played college baseball and high school baseball, I don't know what ball we used. My coach said, here, go throw it, go hit it, go field it, and that's what I did. I can't tell you one ball that I ever used. Okay, they all felt the same to me. I know the Wilson has the high threads, the seams. Uh, Spalding's a little bit low, but then the core and everything else is just the same. Okay, so it's a good ball. All right, you don't have to use it during the regular season, but it is recommended if you want that feel because you do have to use it come sectional time. Coaches, you're allowed 32 games. Uh, get your schedules online if you haven't done so. Uh, the deadline for that is March 13th, which is two days prior to the days that we play. Uh, one issue that we're having throughout West Virginia is 25 people in the dugout. 
When you get to the state tournament, if you're fortunate enough to get to the state tournament, we make that mandatory. There's no exceptions. There's not 26, there's not 28, there's 25. And if security has to come and take people out of the dugout, it's usually taking uh, kids out of the dugout, uh, players in uniform and setting them on the first row of the stands, okay? You guys can help with that process by just following this throughout the regular season so we don't have to eliminate people come state tournament time. But umpires, they're supposed to have 25 max in the dugout and uh, if you can help monitor that too. Uh, that coaches and players combined? That's everybody. Coaches, players, stats people, okay? Uh, that's everybody. And a lot of your dugouts can't even hold 25 and that's why we have the new rule of people hanging out the dugout in unsafe territory. Uh, so 25 is plenty. Uh, that's a lot of players and probably too many coaches and too many other people that just want to be part of the program. Ratings of officials. Um, this one's very difficult, uh, especially with the number of umpires that we have. We're down to 200 statewide. Coaches, if you're going to give fours and fives, you have to actually write what uh, the reasoning is to give them such a, a poor rating. <laughs> Um, I'll be honest, umpires probably do not like fours and fives, umpires probably don't even like threes, um, but fours and fives are very, very uh, critical, um, but just, just be fair, don't base it on wins and losses, uh, base it on performance, base it on rule application if you, uh, if you give fours and fives, don't base it on your opinion. I can give you an example with basketball because that's the season we're in. I have a coach that gave a five, and the first sentence was, these three guys did an excellent job, but they missed one call down the stretch and it cost us the game. Gave them a five. That, that one is hard for, for me to digest um, because they started off with, these three guys did an excellent job. Excellent is one, okay? So you miss one call, probably still one. They're still excellent, not a five. Okay, so be fair uh, when you're rating our umpires. Um, revise your schedules online if you have uh, cancellations, postponements. Make sure you update your schedules, okay, because uh, you have to rate the, the umpires every game. And Alice takes care of all the ratings, and she looks at your schedules. If they're not updated, you could get a $10 fine because she thinks you've played the game, you just haven't reported it because you haven't updated your schedule. Middle school, 18 games, max. We, we recommend wooden bats, okay? Uh, seven inning games, unless you have a double header, and then you have to play five innings, second game, okay? And then pitch count, rules, okay? Make sure you study the chart, understand your limits. You're allowed one scrimmage. And then your practice also starts February 27th, but you have an ending date May 13th. Your season needs to be over by that date. No postseason stuff unless you have a conference tournament. Ejection policy, coaches and players, if you're tossed the first time, okay, it's a three-game suspension. The second time is a six-game suspension. And then the third time, okay, which we hope that you never get to that point, it's one year off of baseball from the time you are ejected, okay? So not only will you lose the rest of this season, but you will lose the beginning of next season, okay? So don't put yourself in that situation. And Charlie will talk about the three-tier system to try to keep coaches in the game uh, because we want them supervising the kids, not uh, somebody just coming, a teacher out of the stands or whatever to play the game. If you do get ejected, it's out of sight, out of sound, uh, can't be uh, coaches. I will say this: if you get ejected, you have to leave the premises. But if a player gets ejected, what do we do with them? Keep them in the dugout. Do not let them leave. Okay. Keep your players in the dugout. They'll serve their three-game suspension uh, starting the following day. All right. So uh, coaches leave, players stay. Here's your important dates, high school coaches, February 27th. I'm sure you have that marked. Your first contest is March 15th. It's also the first day of the Boys State Basketball Tournament. It's on a Wednesday. 
all right? Uh, you're allowed two scrimmages, but the first one can't happen until seven days of practice have happened, all right? So you need seven days of practice before you can scrimmage. First contest we talked about, sectional has to start on the Monday, May 8th. The regional will start on Tuesday, May 23rd, okay? Tuesday, not Monday, all right? Tuesday. If you're a big section, uh, single A or double A, your tournament's probably going to take you two weeks, that section, to get through. So we wanted to give you Sunday and Monday off to go into the series, which is very important, trying to get you to the state tournament. State tournament using the seed to format, June 1, it's a Thursday through the 3rd, Saturday. Interscholastic, use it as a resource. Tobacco, do not use tobacco, okay? We have Ray's, that's one of our corporate partners, uh, anti-tobacco. They do a lot of things at the state basketball tournaments for us, little drills and skills, it makes it fun for halftime. But coaches and players, it's an automatic ejection, three games out. Umpires, what's your penalty if you're using tobacco at a game? Can we fire you? No, because we don't hire you. Okay, you're independent contractors. But we do certify you. We could suspend your certification for a week first time, two weeks second time, okay? There's no use for tobacco at our sporting events. So just make our life easy and yours. Just don't use it, okay? Concussion. This has changed also, guys. And you need, coaches, you need to understand this policy. It used to be that a mild concussion, you could take two or three progressions, throw them in the same day, and get your kid back in about three or four days. Sports Medicine Committee said, no, no longer. One progression per day. So if a kid is concussed, it's a minimum six days out. That's a lot of games. But you're also dealing with brain injury, okay? So it's a minimum of six days out. And only one of these six healthcare professionals can diagnose it and also can return them to play. Parents cannot, U.S. coaches cannot, okay? Uh, dentists cannot, because they're not part of this group, all right? So uh, make sure that you take care of kids. When in doubt, send them out. Umpires, once again, you don't have anything to do with this, except if you see a kid that's just not quite right, you need to ask the coach to take them out, okay? If they get in the batter's box and they're wobbling, you know, call time, coach, can't do it. We need another bat, okay? Get them out of there, protect them, keep them safe, okay? Coaches, one of the last things I'll talk to you about briefly, if, um, well, not if, you do have to take the concussion course every year. You and your assistants have to take the concussion course every year. There are two other courses that you need to take one time in your career. The heat acclimatization course, if you took it last year, you're good to go. You don't need to take it again. Uh, if your assistants took it, good to go. If not, do it this year, get it out of the way, run the certificate, and give it to the administrator. Sudden cardiac arrest, must take it one time in your career, okay? Um, head coaches and assistants. Umpires, there's no requirements for you to take these courses, but it is highly recommended. They're free, and coaches, we've made it easy for you. You no longer have to go to nfhs.learn or nfhslearn.com. We put it on the front of our website. It's in blue. You can take all three courses. It takes about 20 minutes per course. Run the certificate and you're good to go. You're finished, okay? And then the last thing, did any of you happen to watch baseball, the state tournament last year on live stream? Uh, if not, I'm telling you, it's good quality. We've partnered with Metro News and the National Federation, and it's a great broadcast. If you can't make Charleston this year and, and you want to watch the games, go live stream, watch it. I mean, it's like uh, Major League stuff now, okay? They even put sound mics in bases, so you can hear your, your foot crossing the base. I mean, it's uh, really, they, they've elevated the level to, to make it really enjoyable to watch. And we live stream the Super Six in football, both basketball state tournaments, girls and boys, and now baseball. Okay? You guys have any questions for me? Because 
I tried to go as fast as I could. Just, yes. Just real quick, and I'm not saying this will ever happen, but okay. as an official, yes. um, I have seen this happen, where an official and a coach would disagree on a player's, uh, whether or not he's concussed or, you know, he's, uh, you know, the kid says he's all right, the coach says he's all right, as an umpire, maybe we don't feel that way. Right. How is that handled? With these new rules. Does the umpire have the final say? Can the umpire sit the kid? No, it's actually the coach's responsibility, and, and the coach faces consequences uh, for that. I mean, if that coach puts a concussed player in the game, um, a suspension will be the least of their worries, unfortunately, because they'll probably be in a lawsuit. So I'm hoping you guys just work together. I mean, there, there's no rivalry, no game important, more important than a brain. So Coaches, get them out. If they're, if they're not all together, get them out. Okay? Their health and safety is way, way more important. And that shouldn't even be an argument between umpires and coaches with the safety of a child. Just take them. Take them out. Okay? Have them looked at. Hopefully, if you have certified trainers on staff, uh, of course, we were lucky in the Eastern Pain and we did. So our trainer could look, you know, put them through tests. If not, you're going to have to take them out and get them evaluated after the game. Okay? So, yes. Uh, back to the pitch count, middle uh, school pitch count. Yes. On that chart that you had under uh, that 56 to 73 day. Maxes on the left side. Okay, so it's 110 on the left and then 95. Okay, so 70, 71 to 95 will go four days on those younger arms. Okay? All right, any other questions, guys? I appreciate you. I appreciate what you do for the sport. Keep it, keep it going, okay? Let's have a great season. Charlie, you got five minutes, brother. Okay, glad to help you. There's not many rule changes, so that helps out. Yeah, there's not very many. Not very many of them. First one is uh, 232C, and they have uh, put in the rule now that the uh, runner coming home can slide across home plate, and previously they couldn't go past home plate. <laughs> and uh, the way you're going to handle that on cars is, is if it goes through, and uh, it's an illegal slide, when he goes through, we got a ball. What do we have? <coughs> One of the only spots. If they go past the back at second base, what do you call? And, and take out the field coming across the back.
Okay, the uh, Mitch and Field Conduct 331 penalty. We have uh, three tiers here. If the coach wants to uh, come out and talk to you verbally and he's under control and, and he's taking care of business the way he should, it's just a verbal. Nothing to step. If he comes out a second time and he does the same thing again, he just wants an explanation. Give him the, you know, give him the uh, information he needs so that they can work together. And that's how uh, the players uh, see that, and we can get this uh, game under control and uh, move on. But if the coach comes out on bars and you can't get him under control, and he's using foul language or whatever, and uh, if you do that and you decide you want to uh, use a verbal warning for that, make sure you write it on your card. Let the other coach know that what happened, what occurred, <coughs> and then uh, send him back to the dugout. The coach. However, if it goes ahead and you eject him on bars, then he has to sit on the bench. Oh, I'm sorry. The coach has to leave. Yeah. <laughs> the head coach has to leave. Now, if you give them a written warning to the restriction to the dugout, the have to spell out your special report for that? No, not okay. just, not only the injection, right? Just only an injection. There's where we are running the down, uh, showing a verbal that uh, has already happened and you want to do a warning. If the assistant coach <coughs> is the one that's talking to the young bar and he gets uh, restricted to the dugout or whatever, the assistant coach, what else happens at that point? The head coach is, a, is also restricted to the dugout. So keep that in mind. We want to keep the head coach in the game. Let them do what they need to do. And if they throw their cap or whatever they're showing, just go ahead and eject. Or they uh, or race. Okay, uh, let's say we have a runner on the first uh, in this situation here in which the batter has swung the ball and the uh, umpire interferes with the catcher trying to get the runner out and on the second base. If the catcher throws the ball down when they get the runner out, the ball stays alive. If that a throw on the initial throw is caught by somebody like a shortstop coming across if you have runners on the first and third and run on the first and steals. And the shortstop cuts the ball off because the runner on the third and stealing home. As soon as that shortstop touches the ball, it's dead. And you send the runners back. <coughs> um, our signals. Uh, that's the double tag up signal. It's in the rule book, guys. Just so make sure you look at it so you can use that during the ball game. And the other one was is the change in the umpire's manual. Uh, is they changed uh, the U1. The U1 is now first base. And they changed the play umpire is in their PU. If an umpire is, if the coach comes out to talk to an umpire about a call that was made that, that he uh, may have missed, uh, he felt that the umpire didn't see it and maybe his partner did, go ahead and, and get to talk to him and get his thoughts, what he's saying.